stay If you win it Comes and goes in a minute Where's the real stuff in life To cling to Love Hello everyone And welcome to the Boomer Pod Podcast Our guest today is John White a cinematographer, and rollerblader. Hello, John. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. How are you doing? Why don't we jump right in? Love it. What can you tell us about working with Emmy Award-winning cinematographer Bruce Taylor? Oh, man. So Bruce was kind of took me under his wing when I was around 13 years old, he was my best friend's dad. And my parents saw that I had a passion for film. Um, you know, I'd play around with the home video camera and stuff like that. And so he brought me on set when I was 13. I was this young little kid running around. Um, I'd get like the director coffee or something. Although at the time I didn't even know how to make coffee. So I was panicking in the uh, by crafty where you make coffee, trying to figure it out. And he kind of really took me under his wing. He started bringing me on to shoots at like ESPN and Fox and places like that. And he really let me be hands on at a very young age with very little experience. And it kind of paved the way for me to get the confidence to continue my passion in film. <laughs> and have you been friends with him and worked with him ever since? Oh yeah, Bruce is a Bruce is a good friend. I was um and I'm still good friends with his son um Nick Taylor who's now a DP. Um I was with him last night. He just flew back from uh Saudi Arabia. He was filming the uh he was the guy in the ring filming the uh Tyson Fury fight that just happened. Um but yeah, no, I'm still very close with their family. Um we haven't worked together in a while just cuz I live in Los Angeles now and Bruce is still back on the East Coast and and uh but yeah we're still great friends which is which is really phenomenal the older i get the more i appreciate how amazing that contact was at such a young age and how grateful i am that we're still friends <laughs> and what was he doing in saudi arabia uh nick taylor was filming the tyson fury fight that just happened um which is like you know the big big boxing fight of the year and he was like in the ring you know filming there um you know, they match up and, and stuff like that and uh, and recording that. And yeah, he, he was doing that live sporting event, filming it live, which was pretty cool. He said it was pretty stressful. You know, he's like, I was like, that's awesome. He's like, it's great, but it's a lot, you know, like you're in the ring and you're right there and, and there's a lot going on. And whenever you film a live event, you know, it, it's it's carries a little bit of stress because you don't get to do another take if something goes wrong like you do when you're filming a TV show or a movie. It's one and done. Now tell me about the HBO episode that got you a Society of Camera Operators of the Year nomination, John. Oh man, I was so excited about that. So I filmed the show. Um, I was part of the camera team, one of many on a uh, the HBO show Winning Time, which was following, you know, when Magic Johnson joins the Lakers and Jerry Buss kind of revolutionizes like the NBA and kind of what you see today is a lot based off of what Jerry um, started to do back then. So it's this fun um, show based off reality, but it's it's still fictional with all different actors and stuff. And Todd Van Hazel, our DP, um, really wanted to showcase it in an interesting way. So this, the show takes place in the eighties and instead of filming it, like you see things now, he wanted to film it like how things were filmed back in the eighties. So when you watch the show, we're filming it all on actual film, um, eight millimeter film, you know, the old little home video cameras. A lot of people had back then we're filming it on 16 millimeter film and 35 millimeter film. And then we've also dug up, all these super old cameras that they used to use to film live sporting events. So it's really cool when you watch the show, um, we filmed it all on all the equipment they used way back in the day. And it just brings this super nostalgic feeling to it. And so I was part of his team. And what I brought to the table 
was I would skate around on the basketball court with my rollerblades on with the 16 millimeter camera. And I'd be skating around all the different basketball plays in hopes to kind of give this feeling that you're on the court. So when you're watching my shots in the show, it kind of makes you feel like you're almost in the action and you're, and you're right there with the players and, and it really gives it this unique feel. And that combined with all the other amazing things, Todd and the whole team, our other DP, uh, Mihai, um, and our whole camera team, we kind of, we took a lot of risks. Todd really took a lot of risks and it paid off and it earned him an Emmy nomination. And then it got our camera team nominated for uh, the SOC camera operator of the year, which was awesome. <laughs> Can I quote you? Yeah. Okay, here it goes. Recently, I've really enjoyed the creative freedom that comes from rollerblade, rollerblade camera work because it feels like it draws from my experience as a director, DP, stuntman, actor, and editor. <laughs> what do you have oh. to say about that? And, and also comment on why rollerblades? Oh, man. Well, so I'll start off with the rollerblade camera operating. I've worked a lot of jobs in film, um, acting, writing, doing stunt work, uh, stunt coordinating, video editing, directing. Uh, I've done a ton of different things. And when I'm on the court with rollerblades, I'm able to move in a way with the camera that you're not normally able to move with. Like you can only move in that way with rollerblades. And then, like I said, it really draws on all those different things I've learned over the years. So not only is it so fun just skating around and going around the players and everything, but I'm able to make a lot of creative choices that normal camera operators aren't always allowed the freedom to make. And what I mean by that is a lot of times um, the director of photography who's in charge of like how the whole film looks and everything, he or she or they, um, they know what they want and they kind of can really ease you into it so they'll be like all right we want this shot on this lens and then the camera operator gets a little creative freedom to make choices within that window but because my rollerblade camera operating is such a unique thing a lot of times the dps are like all right what are you thinking and i'm able to go in i see the play i suggest the lens i suggest the entire movement i kind of I'm like, hey, after this, maybe I go over and I grab a shot of the coach like this with this way. And so I'm able to really kind of take control. I'm, I'm talking to all the different actors. I'm like, all right, we're going to change the blocking over here. Hey, everyone, come over here. Like, I, I feel like I'm an AD, a director, and the DP when I'm on the court, um, which is so fun because normally a camera operator is not allowed that. And that's why I've really fallen in love with this um, niche because I get to come in. I get all the glory shots where I'm on set and I get to have all the fun. Everyone gets to, you know, work together with me and I feel like I'm in charge. And then once my rollerblade shot's done, I just take a back seat and, and I get to watch the amazing DPs and directors and ADs get to do their thing. And because my shots are so unique and they're not the whole day, it doesn't really feel like I'm stepping on toes or anything. It almost feels for everyone like, oh, I get a second to breathe. And John can take over this little part and I can focus on our next scene or our next coverage. And, um, and it's really fun. I, I don't know. I have, I have so much fun. It, you get the excitement of, cause it's so stunt oriented when I'm skating, it, you get the excitement of like almost com like completing some type of thing. Like it, it has this athletic aspect that you normally don't get that just kind of, I don't know, it gets your blood pump and you're moving around it. It's really satisfying. That's great. What what sporting events have you shot other than that, John? Well, so I've done, like I've shot tennis. Um, I've done definitely skating, any type of rollerblading or, or skateboarding or riding a bike. I've done all that stuff where I follow anyone kind of on wheels like that. Um, I've even held on to cars. You know, I've shot scenes with cars where – I skate up to a car while it's moving and then I hold on to the car window and I got the camera in one hand and 
I'm dragging her along with the car and then I let go of the car and I go to the next scene, which is very fun. Um, I've done that with motorcycles as well. Um, and then I'm really trying to, I haven't done one of these yet, but I've done chase scenes as well. You know, someone just running through like traffic or running down an alleyway, but I really want to get into fight scenes because I feel like it would be such a unique way to do a fight scene, but I just haven't been able to do it yet. I think in our industry, a lot of times it takes a second for someone to see it. Like once they saw me doing basketball, I get called for basketball all the time. And I just filmed something for tennis and it works really well for tennis. And I have a feeling once people see me do tennis, then they're going to be like, oh, maybe we get this guy for tennis stuff. And so um, those sports are really interesting. And one other thing I'll say is I actually did a live basketball game this summer. Um, I can't tell too much about it because it's not out yet and stuff. It, it's a cool, cool thing. But I filmed live basketball on my rollerblades where it's an actual game. So I'm staying out of the way of everyone but I'd find these moments where they're taking it up the court and the defenders aren't there. And I'm able to get on the court and get like a really unique perspective. Um, and me being in the wide shots kind of adds to this almost spectacle of like, wow, they got a rollerblade camera operator on the court. I'm getting these interesting, unique shots that you would never see in an NBA game or any basketball game. And, um, and that was pretty wild because in a live game, I have no idea what's happening. So I really had to stay on my toes and, and make sure I didn't get in anyone's way. Cause the last thing I want to do is, is mess up a shot and stuff. But, uh, that was a really unique experience. It was super fun. And, and that might continue if down the road, who knows. <laughs> now both what's the most exciting and the most dangerous shoot that you've ever been on. Ooh, that's fun. All right. Well, yeah, they probably go hand in hand. Um, I did a shoot. And so this one's definitely the had the most danger involved with it. Um, but I wasn't holding the camera, but I was doing rollerblade stunts for this uh, feature film, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, uh, based off an old book. And it was starring Ben Stiller. Ben Stiller directed it. And we were in downtown Manhattan. Um and probably I think it was 2012 and they had closed off the streets and there's a scene where um, I'm in a business suit and I'm like holding two umbrellas and I'm skating and the umbrellas are kind of supposed to be like ski poles and they had a, and I'm getting towed by a motorcycle. And then I let go of the motorcycle. I hop up a curb. I'm on the sidewalk. And then there's a four foot tall jump. That's probably 12 feet long. And I jump over the camera team while they're pushing a dolly and then I have to land probably 20 something feet away from where the jumps takeoff is. And I'm landing, like I have these two marks where I have to land that are just the size of my rollerblades. And I don't want to deviate from that landing because there's like a VFX shot involved. So I really want to nail that. But also what's happening at that same time is there's a car coming and skidding a stunt driver's coming and he skids and his back the back of the car just misses me by like two or three feet. And so I'm in the air, like looking at my landing while this car is coming. And then I land, the car just misses me. And then I'm like skating through more traffic. And that was definitely the, uh, the most dangerous on set thing I've ever done. And it was really fun. I was 23 at the time I was in New York city. I, I felt like I was on top of the world. It was really cool. And what kind of physical shape do you need to stay in to continue to do this? Oh, man. Well, I'm 35 now, so my routine is a lot different than when I was 23. When I was 23, I was like, you know, eating whatever I wanted and, and not really stretching and just kind of skating and running around. I had endless energy. And now I drink a ton of water. Um, I do yoga every day, various stretches. And then I skate or surf every day. I just got a trampoline again, which I'm really excited about. So I'm trying to jump on that every day. And then I have this really silly, because when I do the camera workouts, these cameras sometimes can weigh up to, like the whole package can weigh over 50 pounds. So I have this little uh, 15 pound weight that I hold like this while I'm watching TV and I'm just kind of moving it all around. Like, and if anyone saw like, 
me, they'd be like, what the hell is this guy doing? <laughs> he looks like I'm just moving it around in the weirdest workout you've ever seen. It makes no sense. But if you know that I'm what I do and I'm a camera operator, you'd be like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And um, for me, I've always, I've never wanted really big muscles or anything like that because in skating and surfing and all of that, you want really strong muscles that are really sleek. So you could be really flexible. Um, you don't want to weigh too much either. So I've kind of just, that's like my workout routine nowadays is I'll move around this weight. I try to skate every day or surf and then a lot of yoga. And I make sure anytime I'm doing any of these activities, stretching or, or skating or anything, I make sure I'm like really warm. Like I'll even wear long johns out under my pants when I'm skating in LA. Cause I found over the years that anytime I get any sort of injury where I pull my back or anything like that. It's always because I wasn't super warm. I was like just a little chilly or I, I, you wouldn't even call it cold, but I never pull any muscles when I'm like sweating and super hot and stuff like that. So that's kind of, that's my focus for my routine these days. Okay. Let me give you another quote, a short one. Yeah. You comment on it. This is a quote from you. These days I tend to go with the flow and trust my gut. <laughs> what did you mean by that? Oh, what man. brought that uh, about? So I'm big into intuition these days. And just and that's what I mean by trust my gut with kind of seeing what the world is just presenting to me. And I try not to swim upstream so much. It's like I try to pick and choose my moments to swim upstream, I'd say. And that kind of brought that about where I was... Um, it's kind of a little long story, but it's really interesting. So I was writing and creating a TV show um, and it had just sold. And so I sold like a TV show that I was going to star in, direct, create, like my my quote unquote dreams came true. At the same time, I had just had another show greenlit at FX, um, which was my favorite network at the time. So like my dreams are coming through. And I've had a ton of friends that have had that success and I've seen them get the success and I've seen a lot of them not really seem that happy. Um, they've kind of just been like stressed out and, and anxious and, and the more success they get, the more almost anxious and stressed out they were. And I was like, that's not going to be me. I'm going to be different than that. And then all this, um, I got my show. They're like, we're green lit it, like get ready, start working on the Bible. And I ended up being just like them. I was stressed out. I was like, oh man, I got to make the pilot of the show really good. I, I got to keep working. I got to work harder. And, um, and then the best thing ever happened was those shows ended up falling apart and it was right around COVID. And I just took a break and was like, okay, I'm just going to focus on like keeping myself happy and meditation and things like that, because I have such a wonderful life. So there's no, there's no reason why I should be so stressed or anxious. I have everything I need. Um, so I'm like, it's my mindset. So I got to work on my mindset. And when I was diving down that path, um, I was kind of going into like this more spiritual path and like a lot of meditation. And, and it got me into really believing more and trusting your gut and trusting what kind of things are being presented to you. And when a job calls or something comes into your life, just what's your initial gut reaction to it? Like, what what do you feel about that? Um, as opposed to I can get in my head a little bit and start to analyze and think and weigh all the options. And I'm like, I still do that. But what's my gut telling me? And that's kind of started to be where I try to let my life take me. And once I started doing that, that's where I got started getting a lot more success. I was a lot happier. And everything kind of started to fall into place. Um, surprisingly, I was like, whoa, I'm working way less or I'm, I'm not working nearly as hard as I was. I'm not nearly as stressed. I'm just kind of enjoying the work and it doesn't feel like work. It feels like I'm just doing things I enjoy and I'm getting so much more success. And so once I saw that trusting my gut and intuition work, I've just kind of tried to lean into that more and more as, as much as I can. Mm, amazing. Now you've made some very interesting observations and here's another one. 
Yeah. You said, I love exploring the relationship between money and happiness. That's amazing. Yeah. Tell me about that. So a lot of times they, um, when I first got into film and stuff um, or any type of art, they always tell you, make what you love, you know, don't, don't try to make other people happy, like make yourself happy, make what you love. And that never really hit home for me until in my late twenties. Um, cause in my early twenties, I was just trying to almost mimic my idols. So Wes Anderson, a director was a big, I was a big fan of his. So you could see me just trying to make versions of that or, trying to almost copy what other people are doing and what I considered really good at the time, as opposed to going with what I really enjoyed and what I like loved. And so once I got rid of that, I started being like, what, what, is, what really gets me excited? Like what really sparks my curiosity? And for me, money and happiness, that relationship is so unique. I remember seeing a study on it where they said money does bring happiness to a certain extent. They've seen in studies where like, say you're living in the United States and you're making $5,000 a year, you, you can't pay your bills. So if you're, um, if you're suddenly making another $5,000 a year, they say that that actually is going to bring a lot of happiness because it's going to alleviate a lot more stress and stuff like that. But it only gets to a certain point where once you're kind of making enough to pay your bills and feel comfortable, you know, I think in LA, that would be around the equivalent of like you're making 120,000 a year or 90 or, or something. They had the numbers worked out, but this was a couple of years ago and, and that changes. And they said, once you get there they didn't see any relationship between the more money you make and happiness like you could be making you know 10 million a year and they said like the the relationship they found between making that 10 million and making 100 million they're like there's no that that 100 the guy the person making 100 million isn't any happier than the person making 500,000 on average and so i found that really interesting because we live in such a society or we live in like a capitalistic country and a capitalistic global environment where money is taught to us to be the end all be all. And you could buy anything with money, but we all know deep down money doesn't buy happiness, but we still can't help, but think it does, you know, everything around us has said that. So I really like trying to have my movies that I write, any short films I'm writing and features that I'm working on. I really try to explore that relationship and make sure every scene and every character is kind of exploring that relationship between money and happiness. And hopefully at the end, trying to teach people that if I ever, ever make any of these things and they get to a global audience, anyone that sees them, they kind of start to think about that. And they may be... Um, I don't know, are able to start focusing on what really makes them happy as opposed to what they think will make them happy. So they start to realize, hey, like, I really just love hanging out with this person in my back, like in the backyard or something, like grabbing a coffee and hanging out with them. Like, I, I have so much fun. I laugh. I feel great. Um, as opposed to, and that's like a free thing as opposed to, oh, we're, we're going to go to this really fancy restaurant and we're going to do all these things. And and we'll get like the nicest wine and we'll get the nicest food and, and I'll bring all these other people and stuff. And in theory, that idea, that image in their head might be like, that's going to be the most fun. But when they're actually present there, they might be like, well, that actually was kind of stressful. And I was kind of, I had so many um, preconceived notions of what that would be. And if you really sit back and look, you're like, oh, I actually have so much more fun getting the three dollar coffee with a friend and so starting to like kind of tailor your life towards what really makes you happy and like the simple little things those priceless moments as opposed to what all the ads and magazines and commercials tell us is going to make us happy <laughs> it's pretty amazing for a young guy and you Thanks. are a young guy compared to me <laughs> I and, feel young. I feel very young. Uh, <laughs> you know what's funny too? An, I used an, to... another another quote. Let me. I hate to keep doing this, but it's it's all there, right in front of me. Yeah. You say I'm focusing less 
on my next job title and more on igniting my creativity while chasing fun and laughs. Laughs are my highest currency. Yes, yes. Give us some thoughts. Oh, man. And I learned a lot of that from my mom. My mom is very, and my dad, too. They're very, um, they just laugh a lot. And they're always making jokes. And, And when I started to think about stuff like breaking down why I want certain things, like for a while, my dream was like, I just want to be a movie star. Like, I'm going to be honest. I wanted to be in big movies. I wanted to be on the big screen. I wanted to, um, you know, win Sundance or win the Oscars. And when I started to ask myself why I wanted this, I just kept asking like, but why do you want this? Why do you want this? And it all boiled down to like, well, it makes, it would make me feel happy. And it would make me like, I I'd be, I'd feel happy. And like, if I was that famous, like I'd be able to like, you know, do these things that would make my friends happy. And we'd be able to do all these stuff. And, and I thought about it and I'm like, all those things I can do now. Like I, I can, I, there's things in my life right now that make me happy. Um, like I can still, you know, I might not have a billion dollars, but I can still invite my buddies over and be like, hey, pizza's on me. You know, I can still do the essential feelings that I was searching for. And when I got there, I once I kind of realized that I'm like, I don't I don't necessarily want all these things. Like if someone told me you could be the most famous person in the world, but your life's not that happy or they could be like, oh, you're working as a janitor cleaning up puke at an elementary school but you're really happy I, the old me would be like I wouldn't be able to pick the janitor job even though I know I should because I'd be like but I want to be the famous actor like I'll figure out a way to make it happy and I'm like no I just told you it, it wouldn't be happy and now I look at it and I go oh yeah give me that job like oh I'm guaranteed to be happy and I and I have fun and I laugh and so I try to take note when I'm out and about in my everyday life of the things that really make me laugh and um the moments where i'm like just crying laughing with my friends and um one of them recently is i've been trying to do more of this we play a poker game at my house sometimes and i play for i found out that like the best recipe is you do like 10 cent chips like you buy in for a couple bucks and you could buy out whenever, or you could cash out whenever you want. You could buy back in whenever you want. Like the most low stakes poker game um, where it's basically your friends get together and we're just kind of joking around. And it, that's like when we're all goofing around like that, like I laugh so much. I laugh so much with certain friends and those friends that I find myself just laughing and smiling with a lot. I'm like, I need to figure out a way to spend more time with them. Um as opposed to the old me might be like, oh, wow, this friend, um, this friend I have, it's a really nice person and great. Like, they're so successful. They're, they're the top of their industry. Like they're, you know, they just won um, all the awards. And, and maybe if I'm friends with them, they could help my career out. And so I used to be like, and I enjoy hanging out with them too. So that's great. And now i I don't really care about that at all. I'm just like, no, like who's going to make me laugh the most? Who's making me feel comfortable and fun? And the more I do that, the more success I'm finding. So like now that I'm not chasing the success and I'm chasing the laughs and fun, like um, I have so much fun. Like I was on set on Friday and the old me, like in my 20s, would want to do a really good job and be like focused and stressed. And the new me, was just like goofing around laughing with the director and the DP and the, and the different actors we had. And, and I did ended up because I had such light, no weight on my shoulders. I ended up doing a great job when my, the shots came up to me, I had no stress or anything. And it kind of reminds me of this other quote where they say that a lot of athletes break world records when the coach tells them, give it 85%. So when they don't have the weight on their shoulders of, giving it my all giving it 110 when they just tell a runner or something like hey just do this run and just like give it a good 85 percent the weight comes off their shoulders they're nice and relaxed and they end up doing better than they ever have done um so that's kind of what i mean by like hunt the last and smiles trying to bring this kind of light 
hearted attitude. That doesn't mean I'm not taking it seriously. It doesn't mean I'm not really into it. It's just, I'm trying to figure out ways to like alleviate the stress um, so that, you know, I can succeed. So I can break those records, but in the most fun way. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. And one final quote. Yeah. The, the everyday hero that is each and every one of us and the idea that kindness is all that matters in the end. What brought you about to that? It was it was it was from a book I was reading, and it might have been in the book called The Power of Now, but I, I'm really bad at remembering names and books, and I I read books all the time. And by read, I listen to them on Audible because I'm very dyslexic. So I, I read, but I'm very slow and bad at reading. Um, so I listened to a lot of audio books and there was a moment in that one book where it was talking about how we're all equal and we're all one. And, you know, someone that's like, there, there's no one, no one's better than anyone else. So like, you know, the person that's maybe just invented this thing that is going to save the world and, and eliminate all the plastic pollution and, you know, do all that. They're really, they're equal to someone who just sits in their apartment and goes to a nine to five job and they don't have any kids and they, and they just take care of this little cat that's like comes into their yard and they just feed and pet the cat. And it's kind of this idea that like, who's to say that life is any less important than this other one. Um, and I remember reading it and it took a while for that to sink in into an actual belief. Cause like, I think that, but for something to really sink in here, it sometimes takes years. And so I remember that seed was planted. And nowadays I kind of have this outlook on life where we're all here for different reasons. We're all one. So like that person might've done the most amazing thing. The person that's just feeding the cat. They might have had the craziest experience in another life or something that brought them to just come to this life and be like, you know what, I'm just taking a break. I'm just here to relax and just be friendly to this cat. And and maybe them doing that, they're admitting like so much love and kindness just around them in everyday life, even though their life might seem maybe on paper a little mundane, like they didn't do anything or they didn't succeed. I'm like, Trust me, they were they were doing exactly what they needed to do, right? Like they're right in the right place, just like this other person was. And so, um, I don't know. I, I try to look at everyone like that, like we're all equal. And then I also try to look at anyone as if they're like they're all the little kid they were. So, like me, like I'm still that little two foot tall kid running around, you know? Like that's me now. And so when I get mad at my dad, say who's um he's like 69 years old and he's yelling, like he's getting, I'm getting mad at him or whatever. I'm like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm, I'm not yelling at this, my dad. I'm yelling at this little three-year-old kid who's like just trying to still figure out life and enjoying it. And, and that helps me um, kind of, you know, look at life that way. So we're all just little kids running around. No one's life is better or, like, or more important than anyone else's. And, uh, and yeah, so that's where I say the everyday heroes. I'm like, someone just putting a smile on someone's face. We have no idea how far that could go. Um, and so, yeah, <laughs> if that makes sense. Tell me about your family, John. Oh, I love my family. I, I live with my sister in L.A. right now. Um, and uh, I live with my girlfriend and then her boyfriend. Um, and... Um, so we got to have this little house right here that's kind of split in two. So we each have our own little areas. Um, but my family, I got a younger sister. She's like a year and a half younger. Um, and then I got my mom and dad. And my relationship with my sister it was pretty classic. We were best friends when we were really little. And then once we got older, it was like, you know, we'd fight when I'm I'm 13 and she's 11. I'm like, get out of my room. Like, I hate you. You know, the, the classic, very stereotypical uh, thing. And then fortunately enough for us, um, we bought like we stayed friends and we had a lot of because we we're so close in age. We had a lot of friends that were mutual friends. And um, and we we just love laughing at how at my parents because my parents are two characters. My dad's a very um, 
super nice guy, very realist. You know, he's like, this is practical. This is what we should do practicality wise. He has a super good heart though. And he sees the world as like, we got to make sure this doesn't happen and this and take care of this. And my mom is just a space cadet. She's just out, not even by the moon. She's out by like Jupiter or Pluto, just floating around being super positive. She's always looking for fun. So I get a lot of that from my mom where she'll come to me and I'll be like, Oh, how was like, I'm talking to her on the phone. And I was like, Oh, what did you do last night? And she's like, Oh, I went to this party. I was like, how was it? And she's like, I pretended like I was 16 years old again. And, and everyone was sneaking me cocktail drinks and they didn't know that I was underage. And, and I was just hanging out with them and I was pretending like I was in, co- like she just makes her own fun. She just comes up with scenarios to make her own fun. And um, anytime she's over with my friends and I'm like, oh, my mom's in town. People are like, oh, let's hang out and, and party and hang and listen to music. And and she really is the life of the party. And I have a lot of friends that would most people would consider the life of the party. And they all would agree. Like my mom, she's just always laughing. She, she can barely get her own jokes out because she's laughing so hard at them. And the jokes aren't that funny, but she's laughing so hard at the joke that it's just contagious everyone just starts laughing with her they're like what are you talking about and so my life growing up was i had my mom at home um fully supportive i'd like yell at her with the home video camera being like hey film it over there i'm making my little home movies and my sister's a year and a half younger so she still had that older brother thing where she's like following me around my dad would go to work he'd come home he'd be exhausted but he'd try to hang out and play with us and my childhood was really supportive and really great and they I think my parents were just like very focused on like just do what you love do what makes you happy like don't don't worry about what other people say or do um just you know like like trust yourself and trust that and like if someone else tells you you can't do something like don't listen to them because like that my dad said that happened to him a lot where people would be like, you can't do that. And you'd be like, you know, it it weighs down on you. And he's like, they don't know. And for instance, uh, in high school, my guidance counselor was like, I, they had to write down what I wanted to be when I grow up. And I'm like, Oh, I want to work in film and movies. And they wouldn't let me write it down because they said it was too unrealistic. And it was funny because at the time I was doing, working with Bruce Taylor, as I mentioned, I was already working in film I was getting ready to go to film school. Like, so it's interesting how I was very fortunate enough to have that rock at home of my mom and dad who were super supportive. Um, And they kind of encouraged anything for me to do. I'm very ADHD. So I'm always bouncing around 10 different things and I get really hyper-focused and they'd always just encourage me. And my dad always thought everything I did was the best thing ever. And, um, and I still make fun of them for it, but it really created this foundation for me to be like, just feel like I have such unconditional love and support at home so that when I went out into the real world and a guidance counselor says, you can't do that. I'm like, yeah, I can. (laughs) Like, you don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) And with good reason, I'm sure your family is very proud. Oh yeah. Well, we have a lot of fun. I just spent the whole summer with my mom and dad. So I was in Maine um, from uh, May, the the unions on strike, the sag after unions on strike, which I voted for. Um, and so I am very happy, like our unions on strike for very great reasons. And I went to Maine for the summer to wait it out and see what happens and spend time with my mom and dad. And they're on a lake in Maine, retired on this tiny little cabin got like one bedroom and then like a big room in the back and everyone's kind of sandwiched together my aunt lives next door and um and I just spent the whole summer with them and my sister came up and visited and we just had so much fun we're just laughing goofing like I would come home from school sometimes and my mom would just be hiding and then she'd jump out and scare me like that that's that's kind of we're really blessed and and they're really proud but they're still teaching me things to this day and and we have a lot of fun and yeah, I'm, I'm so grateful for it. It's so awesome. <laughs> Does anybody else in your family rollerblade? Yes. Yes. So um, I'm the main rollerblader, obviously, but my mom, dad, and sister all rollerblade. 
So I got really into it when I was, I started roller skating when I was five and I got really into it. So then my dad got some skates and then my sister got skates and my mom got skates and um, my sister and dad and me would play roller hockey when we were younger. My mom would skate around. And it's funny, me, me, my, my dad's very athletic and my sister's extremely athletic as well. And we always would kind of give my mom a hard time. Like she's not athletic. And now I look back and I see her right now and I'm like, oh, my mom's insanely athletic. Like our, our whole family is like so athletic. And um, like we always play tennis together or pickleball and always like doing different games. Like when we were up in Maine, we we're water skiing and stuff like that. And uh, and yeah, they all rollerblade. And a couple of years back, they came to visit me and my sister out in L.A. And we did a really fun, we all four of us rollerbladed up and down the uh, Venice Boulevard boardwalk. And we, we had a blast. And if you see in one of my skate videos, actually, so I cast my mom and dad in all my skate videos. And my skate videos are me jumping down rails, um, grinding rails and jumping over stair sets and stuff. And um, in the latest video, Charles Broccoli, it's my dad, mom, and my sister is the one filming on rollerblades. We we're on Venice Boulevard. And um, me and my mom were in rollerblades and we're pretending like we're a gang, you know, and then my dad rolls up and he's like, he makes fun of me. He's like, you're a loser, you know, and I'm like, oh, yeah, let's race. And then we race down Venice Beach and he crashes into the sand. And it's a very silly over the top skit. But uh, you can see my parents there. They don't look like that. But I dressed them all up in silly outfits and and we had a blast. So, yeah, they do rollerblade and you can see them rollerblading. <laughs> Terrific. Terrific. You're a very interesting young guy, my friend. Very oh, thank you. <laughs> what have I missed, John? Or is there um, anything that you'd like to pitch? No, this was actually fantastic. I mean, the biggest thing I like to pitch is just nowadays, it's just like this idea of kindness and um, and just like hunting the smiles and yeah, like that, that's really what I'm trying to put in my work and stuff. So I'm really happy we got to talk about that because I really think like that, that makes such a bigger difference than people realize. Um, and like for the people that are very practical and stuff, and they think that the stress really fuels them. I actually don't believe that I've read a lot about that. I've done, I've read a lot of studies on that. And that's a common misbelief behind people that are very successful that they think that if they don't have this stress and anxiety, that they're not going to have the motivation to create and get things done. And, and I genuinely don't believe that to be true, but I can understand where they're coming from because stress and anxiety, unfortunately can be such a motivator. And anyone that's listening to this, that, that has that mindset, I, I would urge you to at least try to see what it would feel like to, come at it from less of a stress anxiety standpoint and try to explore how to come at it from something that just really is fun and enjoyable and light and, and take all the pressure off of yourself. Um, for instance, ADs on set, a lot of times the assistant director who's in charge of making sure everything's on time and we get all our shots done and kind of coordinating a whole shoot. A lot of times ADs can be kind of getting this done by yelling at people like, Hey, camera, are you ready over this? This is ready this. And, and I've noticed over the years that that just creates such a stressful environment that we actually get less productive. And so even though they think they're being productive by yelling and, and kicking everyone and like, they don't actually kick them, but, you know, kind of giving someone a little kick in behind being like, Hey, chop, chop, like we got to go this, like coming, coming from that, I think actually slows down production and makes their job, which is all about getting things done fast and well, take so much more time. While I was on set on Friday with an AD who was just absolutely phenomenal. She was so calm and, and chill. And anytime she'd be like, Hey, how, how long for camera? Like, are you ready? And, and we moved so much faster because of that, because a lot of times ADs, when they're talking to you like that, you're just not motivated to be like, you know what, I'm just going to take all the time I need. Well, if they're really nice and sweet, I think a lot of people are like, all right, like they don't have the extra stress. They can think a little clearer and they can be like, all right, let's get this done quick. Cause everyone on set knows like 
we're all trying to get this done in the best way possible, as fast as possible. And everyone's trying to do that. So you don't need someone yelling at you to do that. You just might need a little reminder every time or check in like, hey, how's it going? Like, do you think we can get that done in five minutes? Like, yep, 30 seconds, no problem. And also stress is very exhausting. So when hour 13 or 14 comes around on set and everyone's had all this stress and stuff, your brain doesn't work as sharp as it does. Your body doesn't work as fast as it does. You're, you're moving sluggish. You're, you're not in a great mood and you're just not putting out a great product and you're not moving fast. While if you've had a set, if you've been on a set where everyone's kind of been enjoying themselves and moving along, um, like the Daniels are the, the ones that won all the Oscars this year for everything, everywhere, all at once. I've been on a bunch of their sets and they create such a fun environment that's so collaborative and creative and i've never seen anyone come close to moving as fast and efficiently as they do and it's just from this like collaborative friendly environment they say they try to act like they're co uh, camp counselors as opposed to directors and so they're like hey we're all here together to like get things done and we're just kind of overseeing it like a camp counselor as opposed to i'm the big strong important director and um like i said they've won the most oscars i think any film has ever won so there's proof in that but i can also tell you their sets are so fun and they're so productive and um and it's all because they come from that kind of mindset as opposed to a more old school mentality some may say where it's like you're yelling at people and you're and you're really trying to be strict and you're and you're trying to be like i got to state be the big person in charge <laughs> so that was a long answer but yeah it's okay that's okay <laughs> will you come back at a later date and give us an update on your career and your life oh yeah i'd love that i'll let you know i'll let you know well i want to thank you very much for being with us today oh and thank you it's my pleasure yeah you're a wonderful guy you're a wonderful guy and uh, be safe Oh, I will. Be safe and make some good decisions. Oh, I will. I will. And thank you so much once again. I got. I mean, like I said, I'm hunting smiles and laughs. And, and if you've seen me, I've been smiling the whole time. And that's large in part thanks to you. I see you smiling. It makes me smile. These conversations are fun. <laughs> so uh, I appreciate it. I really do. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good one, John. Yeah, you too. Take care. Take care. I'm going to skate the driveway now. My buddy's coming over. I'm excited. <laughs> Bye bye. bye and you will be happy too. So then we bring in John Like, our camera operator on skates. And he is really the cherry on the top of this Sunday that brings all this basketball to life. All of those scenes are very choreographed. People have to be in exactly the right places, and he's like wrapping around and following the ball and going up to the dunks. And then we added the other handheld on top of what he was doing. And I think this year, the narrative inside of the basketball is even more exciting than it was last year.